Thank you very much, Dr. Neeraj Bishdani. Dr. Ashok Shah is busy in another commitment. I welcome all of you to this 10th uh, arthroplasty conclave. And uh, I have uh, with me two very experienced speakers. Uh, Dr. Vikas is well known to all of us because he is with us since the beginning of this conflict. He's a senior orthopedic surgeon in the Indian Armed Forces in the Air Force Wing and he is doing sterling work in arthroplasty and he has published a paper looking at why he strain in the Indian scenario which will be a good starting point for this conclave. And then we have with us uh, an esteemed uh, colleague and uh, orthopedic surgeon who is practicing in Germany. His name is Dr. Atosh and uh, Dr. Vikas has worked with him uh, during his fellowship. And I will ask Vikas to introduce uh, to all of us Dr. Atosh and then uh, we will uh, start with your presentation, Vikas, which will set the stage for Arcos to share his thoughts. So over to you, Vikas. Yeah. Good evening, everyone. So we are lucky today to be able to manage uh, the sterling performer of uh, septic hip revisions, uh, Dr. Arcos. Yeah. Uh, having worked with him for some time, I realize that he is the perfect speaker for us today when we talk about revisions. He uh, did his graduation and he did his medicine from uh, Austria and Hungary but uh, moved on to Germany where he got trained in arthroplasty. He is one of the finest arthroplasty surgeons who has devoted 10 years in one of the uh, highest volume arthroplasty centers, that's the endocrine. And being the fellowship director there, many of us have got lucky and got to know him personally and the way he introduced us to the subject of septic revisions the way he taught us how to do debridement, how to use the antibiotics, the skills which we learned from him. Many of us in India have really gained and today I thought that we are lucky that he shares his thoughts with us so that we all come to know how we handle the septic hips. To begin with, I would like to share some of our experiences with religion. So I'm just, uh, so this is the paper we which we see published in the Indian Journal of Arthroplasty. We looked at our work of revisions of about seven years. Yeah. So, with increasing number of arthroplasty being done in our country, we see that there is a definite rise in volume of revisions. About a decade back, the revision hip was a relatively rare surgery and it's been in the last decade that we all have realized that we are short of expert. More more hips can be offered to across the spectrum age groups for various disabilities due to the phenomenal success of the primary hip arthroplasty. But the limited experience and infrastructure which exists for revisions really challenges our system. There is extensive inventory which is required for these surgeries, the expertise, the knowledge, the cost involved is prohibitive at times and to add to that the risk of failures of revision is high. So looking at all this we need to formulate a strategy, a public health strategy to handle revisions over the next two to three decades, which are going to see a large number of these surgeries come down. So we just wanted to do an epidemiological review of the cases. We saw that we did it for 200 plus uh, HIPAA reconstructions, adult reconstructions in our center. This is a tertiary referral center, the largest army joint replacement center which receives patients from all over the country. So let me tell you that 60% of patients were the index surgery was done elsewhere and for the rest it was from the same institute. So when we look at the load of revision, almost 22% of our primary work was revision and uh, which remains almost the same over a period of 7 years. And when we look at the split, prosthetic joint, unlike the web where gradually these revisions have taken over, we have 
are known to infections. 38 percent was infections, 30 percent aseptic using this out of 260 revisions which we did. Dislocation, peritoneal fractures, implant breakage was similar to the West, but prostatic joint infections, as comes out with various other studies, also remains number one still in developing developing countries. When we talk about period of these revisions. So it, it's kind of a temporal profile that we uh, try to study. The early revisions was 42 percent that means uh, and fair share of these were infections. The midterm revision was 34 percent and 20 percent was the revisions as aseptic revisions were still not caught on. Share late revisions still remains less in our country. Looking at the temporal profile of infections, surprisingly, uh, a trend which is very a little different from West, I would say, is that we see more polymicrobial infections, more gram negative, and they are kind of delayed to late. Early first three months infections are relatively less. The delayed, that is, three months to two year infections, are the maximum in number, and many of them are polymicrobial and difficult to treat. Unfortunately, even our microbiology support is limited. We still don't have the advanced techniques of culturing, the gene excising systems, the, the, the sonification of implant and the ability to go to extended cultures and specialized microbiology teams in centers to get the bug and to be able to offer one stage revision. Because if you don't know the bug, it's difficult to do one stage revisions. So half of the infections we could not get the bug and the other half where we got the bug 25 percent were polymicrobial and gram negative surprisingly MRSA was very few maybe because these patients were not from multiple uh, hospitals uh, transferred in so maybe they were straight from the community so MRSA was less however even staff overall was less as compared to the gram negative it was different from the west looking at causes of aseptic we saw that uh, amongst the cemented and uncemented reasons, two decades back, large volume done was cemented hips. We still have our load of cemented hip revisions more than uncemented when it is total, when we talk about total hip. And when we compare the bipolars, the uncemented bipolars had a, a higher load of revision. Maybe this is because the stem used was not of the total hip design. These were monoblocks. Uh, bipolars of poor geometry design and fertility, which were used in yester years and have led to failures. However, cemented bipolars now have lesser failure as compared to uncemented bipolar. This could also be due to elderly age group. Amongst the stem and cup, uh, almost equal when we talk about the total failures, stem was overall little more than the cup failures. This is maybe because of the cement divisions which we have load higher than the uncemented. Coming to the dislocations, in 21 cases, that is almost half of the revisions, the cup version was a problem. Whereas on the stem side, usually it was the stem offset uh, causing impingement and levering out, which was an issue. And uh, to some extent, sometimes the stem version was also an issue. So these were the causes as documented. So it was a prospective study where we documented the cause of revision by interviewing the operating team. So this was a uh, dislocation risks and how it occurred. Very prostate fracture, as we all know, P fractures are the ones which are generally revised. So uh, most of them were V1, V2, V3 and very few C types had to be revised. So when we look at our study, as compared to the West, the infection was number one cause in early and even midterm. It was only late that some septic, aseptic revisions came in. The instability was similar to the Western studies. The fracture rate, periprostate fracture leading to revisions was again same and implant breakage. However, sepsis remains the primary cause of failure in our country. So this is what I wanted to share. And now let's hear uh, Dr. Akos. I'll invite him to share the pearls about septic revisions, which he is the experts i'll just stop sharing my screen yeah akos so can. welcome dr akos and uh, vikas has set the stage for you uh, our country uh, has to grapple with this uh, number one cause so 
we look forward to hearing from you your views about it thank you very much uh, good afternoon everybody um thank you dr kiran thank you, thank you dr vikas for inviting me and i'm uh, happy to um uh, join this meeting i think it's a very good idea to to organize such a meeting uh, in a webinar uh, we can't uh, get together in a congress but we can uh, join a lot of orthopedic surgeons uh, through the internet with webinars since this is a very effective way for uh, sharing the knowledge i say hello to all of my indian friends who joined me in hamburg as a, a fellowship and um, i miss you guys it was a very, very nice time with you in endo clinic now uh, two years ago i changed from hamburg to berlin and now i'm here head of department for orthopedic and trauma surgery uh, in the southwest of berlin and we work here uh, with my fellow colleagues uh, this hospital is not as big as endo clinic but we try to do our very best so now uh, can you help me how i can share my uh, yeah just press the green button the share screen and your laptop will be seen yeah green button yeah can you can you see uh, we need to button. see your laptop so just press share screen yeah, yeah. excellent no it's fine yeah yeah okay so uh, we are talking about prosthetic joint infection and uh, Vikas mentioned that the prostate joint infection is number one, number one reason in your country for revision. Uh, in Germany and in the European Union, uh, prostate joint infection is not number one. It is maybe number three or number four. The most uh, revisions we perform for uh, aseptic loosening or dislocation or uh, periprosthetic fracture. And number three or number four is the prostate joint infection. It's very important to think about the possibility of prostate joint infection. And if it's the number one reason in your country, then it is not so difficult to think about it. But if it's number three or number four, and you say, I am a perfect surgeon, I have never septic cases. There are such surgeons in Europe, and they say, I have never uh, septic uh, cases. You have to think about the possibility. When you have a patient with a perfect implant, it is uh, well implanted, everything is correct, uh, the, there's no dislocation, no loosening, but the patient has uh, complaints like pain, and the leading symptom is always the pain. Especially two years after primary surgery, you have to think about uh, the possibility of prostate joint infection. The other clinical signs are not so reliable, so the most important uh, sign is the pain. A fever or uh, any signs of inflammation or any local signs of inflammation are, are not so common and not so reliable. The most reliable uh, sign of infection is the pain. And when you have a painful joint, artificial joint, like total hip or total knee, I know this is in this uh, meeting, we are talking about the hip mainly, but I will uh, talk about both joints, okay? If you agree about hips and knees, because um, many of you deal with also, also with, with hips and knees. So the diagnosing of prostate joint infection is based on the history, physical examination, blood tests, but most importantly, the synovial analysis. And uh, when you go, go for blood tests, we check the CRP. Of course, you can also check the sedimentation rate. But uh, at this moment, we have no single test which can prove the prostate joint infection. So there is no test with 100% sensitivity and specificity. That's why you have to use a panel of diagnostic tools. And the most important thing is the aspiration. This is a short video. Can you see the video? Yes, we can. Uh, yeah. Okay. So this is a short video about the aspiration. And we will show also how to use the Sinovashur test, but it's not the most important thing in this video, the Sinovashur, but it is more important to see how meticulous uh, the surgeon works in order to avoid a contamination with ster sterile uh, prepping, sterile gown, sterile gloves, sterile syringe, of course, and to perform the aspiration in a sterile environment. Then you go for 
the tests. You can do the Sinova Sure test if it's available. In Germany, it's available. I don't know if it's available in India, but um, it is a quite a good test because you have a more than 95% uh, sensitivity and specificity for possibly joint infection, and you need only two drops of the synovial fluid uh, to carry out the bedside test, which is quite good uh, to uh, rule out infection. If it's positive, it could be infection, but to be honest, it can be also um, metal on metal wear, for instance, or any particle wear. So if it's negative, you can be quite, quite sure it's not an infection and not an inflammation. If it's positive, you have to analyze other parameters uh, the leukocyte esterase test, which is carried out here in this video, it's very easy and very cheap to carry out. And uh, you can find the positive cases uh, with uh, quite a good uh, sensitivity and sens sensitivity. The cell count is very important. If you have a good lab, you have to go for the cell count and uh, the polymorphonuclear percentage. The consensus meeting of Philadelphia uh, it was a big topic to discuss about the cell count analysis. Uh, and we have the threshold at 3000 uh, cells per microliter and 80% uh, polymorphonuclear nuclear percentage. And this is very important to, to see this number because if you have granulocytes more than 80%, regardless the number of the cells, so it could be also 2000, but if you have 85% granulocytes, it's most likely it's an infection. So you have to look on both the cell count, absolute number of, of the cells, the leukocytes and the granulocytes. If you have a high cell count and a high percentage of polymorphic nuclear cells, you can be quite sure it's an infection. We have investigated differences between different joints. We had uh, 255 hips and 269 knees, and we saw uh, some differences. And we saw that the threshold for this infection is lower in the knee and higher in the hip. I don't know the reason why. Maybe the hip is uh, in the deeper layers and there's more soft tissue coverage. Whatever the reason, but in our series, we had a lower threshold for knees and a higher threshold for hips and also a lower threshold for the polymorphonuclear percentage. So in Europe, we have the tendency to go with the granulocytes down to a percentage of 60%. So you have more than 60% uh, granulocytes, it is an infection in both hips and knees. Uh, again, in the Philadelphia consensus meeting, we had a threshold of 80%. The leukocyte esterase test is a, is a uh, bedside test. It's very easy, very cheap to carry out. I showed you in the video, and you have um, sensitivity of 100% and specificity of 96%, meaning that if you have a, a negative test, you can be quite, quite sure that it is not an infection. If it's positive, you have to consider other uh, inflammatory disease like rheumatoid disease or gout, or um, particle wear, or metal on metal problems, trulianosis, whatsoever. But if it's negative, you can be quite sure it is not an inflammation, not a um, prostatic joint infection. Of course, if you have the possibility to use alpha defensin, then it is a very, very uh, strong tool because regardless of the organism, regardless of the gram type, regardless of the virulence of the organism, you are able to show the infection with a sensitivity and specificity for 96 of 97 percent. Uh, if you have the possibility to use the ELISA test in the lab, it's even better. We have point of care tests for heart attack, for pregnancy, for HIV. Now we have also the uh, bedside test uh, for the alpha defensin. This is the Sinovashur test. Uh, here you can see the sensitivity is not as high as for the lab test with the ELISA, but the specificity is quite high. So if you need it in the office, uh, you can rule out infection. Of course, there you need some accumulation of um, the alpha defensin, which is a protein is produced by the leukocytes uh, in the presence of bacteria. So you need some accumulation in the joint in order to be able 
to detect the alpha defense in the joint. That's why it's not a good idea to, perf to perform the Sinovashur test in uh, draining sinus, because if you have a draining sinus, then the, the fluid, the synovial fluid is running out of the joint and you have no accumulation of the alpha defense in. To be honest, if you have a sinus, you don't need a fancy test like Sinovashur and anything else because a, sin a, a draining sinus is a prostatic joint infection in 100% of the cases. So when you go back to the question which tests are to be done, uh, I recommend to do these tests. So first of all, culture, because you want to know the bug. And as Rick has mentioned, if you don't know the bug, it's difficult to perform a single stage revision, but it's also difficult to carry out a two stage revision because it's always easier to, to treat the patient uh, targeted if you, don't, if you don't, uh, do know the, the bug the treatment options are much better, both locally and systemically. So culture is, is a very, very uh, important uh, issue. And the leukocyte esterase as a bedside test, which is cheap and uh, you can do it uh, in any country of the world. The cell count with the granulocyte percentage, when you have a good lab background, you can do that and uh, it is very useful. The CRP is of course a, a must uh, to detect the, the blood, but you have to be aware of uh, CRP because there is there are 20% of the patients with a proven PG, a PGI who have a normal CRP. So only 80% of the patients with PGI have an elevated CRP. So if the CRP is negative, it, it, it means uh, nothing. So it is one of the options, but uh, you have to go for an, uh, other options to prove. And if it's available, then you can use alpha defense in ELISA or the Sinovashur test. So how to diagnose the PGI? You have several steps and several options. First, when you have the suspicion with a painful joint, you go for aspiration and serum lab test. Of course, after x-ray, but physical examination and x-ray is baseline. So first aspiration and serum lab test. If you are lucky, you will find the bug and you will find the positive um, CRP and cell count and all these things. But it's only 60% of the patients in Germany. In 40% 40 40 of the patients, uh, you don't find anything, but you have still the suspicion for prostatic joint infection. In these cases, uh, I asked the patient to um, present uh, in two weeks again. So after you go for two weeks of uh, culturing at, after the first aspiration. If, if you didn't find anything, but you still have the suspicion, you go for a second aspiration uh, as earliest two weeks after the first one. And you do, you repeat everything, you do the same. And you will find another 10 to 20% of the patients uh, with infection, but you will still have 20% you find nothing, you find no germ, you find no uh, proof for the infection. In these cases, we go for open biopsy. And in the hips, it's, it makes sense to go for open biopsy. In the knees, you can also do an arthroscopy, but you need five cultures. You need five uh, tissue samples from the joint. Uh, and to histology. So you go for both histology and microbiology workup from the biopsy. And if you don't find anything, you have no uh, bug at this point, then you go for two-stage revision or explantation uh, because the patient has pains, you have uh, no other options for diagnostic and it's easier to uh, remove everything to get a lot of tissue samples from the joint and then go for a second stage revision after uh, uh, working up the diagnostics. Uh, there is no reason to do a third aspiration or fourth aspiration. So this is the um, most reasonable workup of diagnostic in the PGI. And of course, when you have the diagnostics, you have to work together with your microbiologist specialist because you're a good surgeon, but you are not smart enough to understand the bugs, to understand the antibiotics, to understand a lot of things, the response of the body, the response of the bacteria, 
So I recommend to work together with a microbiologist or an infectious disease specialist because together you are a successful team. And then you have to make the right, the right decision. What kind of surgery should I perform? Is it an early infection? Is it a late infection? Uh, do we need uh, one stage revision or two stage revision? Uh, do we need antibiotics? Which antibiotics to use in the cement? Which antibiotics to uh, use in an IV line? And so on. So we have a good publication from the endoclinic by Dr. Frommelt. This is my uh, colleague from this hospital where I am working now. Uh, this is Professor Rusman, who is a very well-known microbiologist. We work together, and we, I always have a recommendation from his team for my patients to treat. Coming back to the Philadelphia uh, consensus meeting, where we had um, a new recommendation to use a scoring system for the diagnosis. And uh, in the previous 2013, uh, Philadelphia consensus meeting, we had also minor criteria and major criteria. Major criteria when you have two times the same bug or you have a training sinus. So there is no doubt there's an infection. But in the most cases, you don't have uh, the major criteria fulfilled, but you have the minor criteria. And in the last meeting, 2018, we suggested to use the scoring system. And um, when you have more than six points, it's an infection. When you have less than three points, it's not an infection. And when you have four or five points, it could be an infection, but it could be also uh, something else. So it is very useful to, to use this um, scoring system. And of course, you have to go for a CRP or D-dimer. You have to go for a sedimentation rate. You have to go for aspiration of the joint with the cell count or leukocyte esterase or positive alpha defensin. So you have options here to evaluate the synovial fluid uh, in any country of the world. You have one of these items. Uh, the same with the polymorphonuclear percentage with the granulocytes and culture and histology and the visible prurence of fluid. You know, prurence can also be a sterile joint with the metal on metal um, bearing surface, for instance. There are several scenarios which are interesting. So in this case, you have an elevated CRP uh, with an elevated, elevated cell count, and you have a positive culture. So this is a straightforward case. You have 10 points. Uh, it's clear and PGI, no doubt. You have some difficult cases where you have a normal CRP. As I mentioned, 80% of the PGI patients have an ele elevated CRP, but 20% can be normal. You have an elevated granulocyte. Uh, you have no uh, positive culture, but the alpha defensin is positive. So is it an infection or is it not? You have, not, uh, you have less than six points. So the recommendation is to repeat the workup, to go for second aspiration. It could be, for instance, a metal on metal surface. You, so you have to test, you have to check the x-ray, you have to check the implant is it a metal or metal bearing? Is it possible to have a metal or metal reaction? Maybe you have to go for an MRI to see the pseudotumor in this case. So further uh, workup is needed. The other case, other difficult case, you have a normal CRP, you have an elevated uh, cell count, but the granulocyte percentage is normal, culture is negative, three points. It's also quite straightforward because it is not an infection. You have uh, no elevated granulocytes, no positive culture, no elevated CRP. It could be maybe uh, aseptic loosening. Sedimentation is elevated and the cell count is elevated, but the granulocytes are normal. It could be um, a rheumatoid arthritis, excuse me, this is my phone. Could be a rheumatoid arthritis or any other inflammatory disease or uh, aseptic loosening whatsoever. And, and so on and so on. I don't want to, uh, maybe the contamination is interesting. I don't want to uh, talk too much about this, but it's quite interesting to, to, to play with this scoring system. And maybe uh, contamination is interesting because sometimes you have a positive culture, but everything else is negative. In these cases, you have to consider uh, another workup because it could be a contamination. And in, so, in some cases, uh, we have nothing, patient has pains, 
We have a positive culture, but everything else is negative. It's a very difficult decision to say, is it an infection or not? Is it a contamination or not? What to do? In these cases, I recommend to repeat the whole workup. And to be honest, we are good guys. We are smart guys and we are skilled guys, but sometimes we have to make decision alone and this is not always uh, easy. And when it's about our own patient, our complication, uh, it is not so easy to be honest to, each, to, to, to yourself. And that's why it's very useful to have a meeting on a regular basis with your colleagues. Uh, part of the meeting is the microbiologist, the infectious disease specialist, nurses, pharmacologists, uh, radi radiologists, whatsoever. The bigger the team, the better it is. And you can discuss your, your findings, you can discuss your plan, how to treat the patient. And then you can follow your treatment algorithm. This to, to, briefly, our treatment algorithm. First, we have to know, is the uh, joint infected, yes or no? Uh, when it is infected, do we know about the bugs? Do we know the organism? Yes or no? If no, then we go for two stage, if yes, then we have to know about the virulence. Is it a highly virulent uh, germ, uh, difficult to treat, then to go for two stage. If it's easy to treat, go for single stage. If uh, the patient, if, if it's an early infection, the, sta the implant is stable, we know the germ, then we go for there. So it's quite easy. Of course, there you have some cases where you cannot do a big surgery. The patient cannot be operated too old, to uh, sick whatsoever, then you have to go for long-term antibiotic suppression, but I don't want to talk about this. You have also some cases where you have to make uh, an intraoperative decision and you need some intraoperative diagnostics. After the workup, you have also the possibility of uh, intraoperative um, diagnostics. Frozen section, it's not available everywhere, uh, not available in endoclinic, uh, not available in many, many hospitals. In my actual hospital in Berlin, it's available, but it's not always easy to, to organize. Leukocyte esterite strips are every, uh, available everywhere, so I recommend to use this in the theater. Sinovashur, it's good and available in some countries, but not all countries, and it's quite expensive. So when you need a quick decision, you go for leukocyte esterase in the theater. Of course, when you go for um, sampling, you need always more samples. I always say um, three or five samples for culture and two samples for histology uh, are sufficient. Swaps, we don't do swaps because they have a high uh, false positive, false negative percentage. And sometimes you have also cases like this. This is a total knee replacement uh, from the endoclinic. It was a revision. And quite soon, the patient developed some osteolysis here and here, as you can see. And then the dislocation of, um, of the femoral component and uh, osteolysis of the medial condyle and the loosening of the femoral, condyle, uh, femoral component. And uh, it was quite uh, quick after surgery and we, asked, we did an aspiration and you can see it's like a pus, it's like creamy pus. But leukocyte esterase was negative and Sinovashur was negative. And culture was also negative. So we went for uh, aseptic revision on the femoral side, no septic revision because it was uh, not an infection, but it was a reaction, granul granulomatous uh, reaction on the cement or any other reaction. Uh, we, revived, we did a revision on the femoral side with uh, trabecular metal cones and uh, implant, a hinge implant, but it was not an infection. But sometimes you have pus like this, creamy pus in the joint, and it's not an infection. It's very seldom, but it happens. So when you have cases like this, it is reasonable to go for culture from the retrieve implants because there are some bugs you can only detect from the biofilm from the surface of the implant. 
And in doubtful cases, you go for this, and uh, then you have the possibility of uh, sonication. Uh, the sonication is a method when you can put the whole implant into the water bath and to release the biofilm from the surface of the implant with um, ultrasonic device, and then you can detect 99% um, of, the, of the germs. So you have to retrieve the implant, put it in a sterile box and send it to the lab. So this is, this is an option that we use in Germany for intraoperative uh, uh, detection of, of the bugs. So this is the diagnostics. Now we go for the treatment options. We, as I mentioned, uh, we have several treatment options. In the early infection, you can go for a DARE. If you have an acute hematogenous infection where the symptoms are not longer than 30 days back, uh, or you have an early positive joint infection in the early phase of the primary implantation. Uh, if you have the implantation not longer than 30 days back. So this is an early infection. Everything else is a, is a late infection. Everything beyond 30 days, doesn't matter if it's acute hematogenous or early PGI, it's a late infection. And then you, go, you don't go for there. So in the early timing, you can go for there, which means debridement. So you open up the joint, you uh, remove the um, polyethylene and you remove the, head, the femoral head, you remove, you remove everything which can be removed easily and um, the modular implants and then you debride the joint, you wash out with uh, six liters of antiseptic solution like a polyhexanate solution or iodine or um, vinegar solution whatsoever, some antiseptic solution. And then you go back with the new implants, new uh, modular implants like new polyethylene liner, new femoral head and uh, close the wound, which is very important. You close the wound. So there is no open uh, wound therapy for there, no vac therapy or anything else with open therapy. And then you go for uh, antibiotic treatment. Uh, very important that you have solid implants and no bone loss. So it's only for the early cases. And of course, it's a question of time. So you have to make the decision very quick and it has to be a um, short period with symptoms after onset of the symptoms in the hematogenous uh, infection or a short time less than 30 days after primary implantation. Everything else is a late infection and everything else needs uh, stage revision. Even the single stage revision is a stage revision because you do two operations in one session. So you don't forget one stage is also a stage revision like, uh, like two stage, but in one session. Which one is better? Of course, uh, it's a question of uh, belief, it's a question of tradition, it's a question of your education, it's a question of uh, the patient's uh, intention, and uh, it's a question of money, of course. So if you are a good surgeon, you can do both. You can do one stage, you can do two stage. Which one is better? Uh, I like the one stage more, but uh, in the literature you can see, you can read a lot of papers for one or other uh, surgery. Um, you can see here a patient walking several days after one stage revision, climbing the stairs only several days, three, four, five days after surgery. So when you ask him which one is better, one stage or two stage, he will say one stage is fantastic because he can walk, he can climb stairs, he has no limitations. And when you compare this guy with the patients with a spacer, it's a huge difference. So when you ask me which one is better, I tell to you one stage is better. If you read the literature, you can see there are no big differences. Both methods in Europe, at least, have success rates something about 90%. For both, in this paper of George, which was uh, published 2016, it was a systematic review with a lot of papers, and um, there was no superiority of uh, two-stage or one-stage over the other method. 
In the two stage, you have to consider you have a good infection control, you have the possibility to make two debridements, you have the possibility to clean up the joint two times, two surgeries, but also the drawbacks of two surgery. Um, you have to consider maybe the patient is too ill, too sick, too old for two surgeries. And if you have one possibility to help the patient, it is maybe better for uh, her or him. And uh, that's why we recommend to do one stage in uh, the most cases. It is also cost effective, of course, one surgery is cheaper than two surgeries. And um, it's getting more, more and more popular worldwide. Uh, it was only the endoclinic and some other hospitals, right in the hospital, and some centers uh, also in India and France, in Paris, to go for one stage. But now it's getting more and more. And even in the United States, uh, there are more surgeons starting with one stage because they see it's reasonable. It's cost-effective, patients like it, surgeons like it, and of course you have some uh, possibilities to do so. In the endoclinic, this is, when you have been in the endoclinic, you can recognize this is the septic uh, theater, theater number one, where I was always uh, operating my patients. And um, also in the endoclinic, we operate not all the patients with one stage, but uh, 85 to 90% of them. And 10 to 15%, we have to go for two stage because we don't know the germ. So the indication for one stage in my eyes is to have the positive joint infection with a non-germ. It should be a normal, straightforward germ, not difficult to treat, uh, not very highly uh, resistant or highly uh, aggressive. So I don't like enterococci, for instance, but uh, staphylococci, MRSE, is a possibility and uh, P. acnes, or, so you can do a lot of germs with one stage when you know them and when you have the susceptibility and the bone stock is reasonable and the white and the soft tissues are reasonable. In this case, you have a, a PGI on the right hip with an uncemented modular stem, titanium stem, which was uh, quite solid. In this case, we did a um, Osteotomy, longitudinal um, osteotomy uh, to remove the stem and go for a cemented um, stem one stage, and the patient uh, was doing well. All the other cases you have to do for two stage because you don't know the germ, you don't know uh, antibiotic therapy, um, or if you have a soft tissue situation with a sinus or some defect or bad soft tissue quality, then you go for two stage. And in these cases, I use this kind of spacer in the hip, which looks like, I mean, looks like a total hip replacement, but it isn't. It is a um, uh, cement coated polyethylene liner from the dual mobility cup and um, that, uh, a liberately, um, how to say that, um, a poor cementing technique for the stem with a lot of antibiotic loaded bone cement around. And this is my space where I'm using and the patients are very happy and they can walk quite without any um, limitation. In the knees, we use these kind of spacers. And um, of course, in the, in the two stage, you have to consider when to go for reimplantation because um, in many cases, you don't know if the patient is free of infection. And we consider the patient free of infection when you have no clinical signs of infection, no fever, no pain, no local signs, the wound looks okay, the stitches are removed, the soft tissues are recovered, there is no, not a big inflammation, the CRP is back to baseline, and then we consider the patient for free of infection, and then we go for the reimplantation. We don't go for aspiration, we don't go for bone scan, we don't go for alpha defensin or any other tests. In the regular time, six weeks after explantation with a spacer, you can go for reimplantation. In this case, uh, it is not a good case for one stage, of course, because you have a big defect and the draining sinus. So in this case, I wouldn't go for one stage. Uh, first, I would remove everything, go for a gastrocnemius flap, and after that, I would go for the reimplantation. 
Uh, also, in this case, you have a chronic osteomyelitis, post-traumatic infection. We had no, no bugs in this case. You, have, you can see the old antibiotic uh, beads. And, uh, of course, in this case, you have to go for uh, open biopsy, remove the hardware, go for diagnostics, uh, resect the bone, which is uh, chronically inflamed, and there's osteomyelitis. And then um, you go for the implantation with an antibiotic loaded bone cement and uh, mega prosthesis. When you go back to the literature and see the results of one stage, it's quite encouraging. We had also a follow up of 70 patients, the biggest series, one of the biggest series, uh, and with a reasonable follow up of 10 years uh, with 91.5% per success rate. This is uh, as good as with a two stage revision. So we are quite confident to perform the, two, the one stage. Which, which patient to select for one stage revision? Also a good question because the most patients want to go for one stage and ask you to do so, but not all of them fit, uh, are fit for the one stage revision. So the patient has to be uh, motivated. You, know, you need to know the germ and the susceptibility. Um, you, the patient has to be fit for local and systemic antibiotic therapy. So if the patient has a kidney failure, you have to consider if you can use vancomycin in a high dose a systemic uh, manner because the patient has a, a higher risk for, for renal failure for kidney failure. So in these cases, you have to discuss with your infectious disease specialist if the patient is fit for that. But uh, <clears throat> a poor general condition is not an exclusion criterion for me for the one stage revision um, because these patients are really need only one surgery and this one surgery has to be successful uh, uh, because these patients cannot be operated several times. So coming back to the treatment options, what are the key steps of the one stage septic exchange? And uh, when you have been in the endoclinic and when uh, you saw the uh, debridement in the theater, the radicality and the aggressive uh, debridement, my friend uh, told me it's a maniac debridement. Um, sorry, sorry, I have to answer the phone. Herr Phoebe? Ich melde mich gleich. Ich, bin, ich sitze jetzt in einem Webinar. Ich melde mich gleich. Ne? Ach so, ich kann jetzt nicht. Ja, tschüss. Sorry. Um, so the, the radicality and the aggressive debridement are the most important steps to debride the soft tissues and the bone uh, to wash out the particles, to wash out the bugs with the pulsatile jet lavage and the local antiseptic solution and then to re-drape, re-scrub, use new instruments and go for the reimplantation in the second part. Now I will show you some pictures of the knee. I know you are, most of them, most of you are uh, hip surgeons, but you can see here a knee with the approach. Here's how to mobilize the implant, which is solid. You use a power saw to mobilize the implant and the cement interface to remove the solid implant. <coughs> And then you can use chisels and power saws to remove the implant from the bone without any bone loss. And when you are lucky and uh, you were meticulous and uh, not too aggressive with your chisel, then you can remove the implant with uh, any massive bone loss. And uh, this is how to mobilize. Of course, you need special, special instruments. Uh, and then you can tap it out with this kind of device. Okay, now it's removed and there you can see there is no bone loss. Then you can go for the debridement to remove the membrane, uh, debride the bone with the power saw to freshen up the surface, to remove the membranes, to remove the bugs. In the same in the hip, after removal of the implant, you have to remove the, the cement. When you have cement inside, uh, all the cement particles may have uh, a biofilm membrane and bugs on the surface. So it is mandatory to remove all the cement 
all the foreign material. I prefer to do, do it in the endomedular way, not to do uh, ETO. Of course, if you have a lot of cement and it's difficult to remove from proximal, from the uh, endomedullary uh, way, then you have to go for ETO to remove the implant, remove the cement, remove all hardware in order to debride. But I try to, remove, try to avoid ETO in the most cases. You need special chisels, special burrs, special instruments to remove the cement. But it's very important. Then you debride the bone after removing all the hardware or the cement. You debride the bone and uh, you, you clean up the surface. Of course, in the knee, you have to debride the posterior aspect of the knee as well, which is a little bit dangerous, but it's uh, important to debride the, door, the posterior capsule and uh, the bone, the proximal tibia, the distal femur. And then you use your jet lavage to wash out with local antiseptic solution and um, remove all the small particles, cement particles and bacteria. You can use uh, several, you have several options for uh, antiseptic solutions. I prefer using uh, the 0.05 percent polyhexanate solution, uh, three or three to six liters of them with a jet lavage, and then you can see it's very clean uh, macroscopically and microbiologically. You can see the posterior aspect of the knee, the posterior capsule, which was uh, debrided. As I mentioned, it's uh, dangerous because of the popliteal vessels, but uh, if you are familiar with the technique, you can do that quite um, easily and it's important to remove all the synovial membrane from all over the knee, uh, even on the posterior aspect. As I mentioned, uh, you go for um, a new setup, in the one stage, sometimes also in the two stage. Uh, interoperatively, you can change your instruments to clean instruments. You can do a redraping, you can change the lamp handles, the suction tips, and uh, new gown, new uh, gloves, in order to minimize the contamination. In the total knee replacement, you go then for a reimplantation with rotating hinge implant. We prefer using the cemented implants. We prefer using the hinge in the knee because it's a good choice for the prosthetic joint infection. Why? Because you debride a lot, you remove all the soft tissues around the knee, only the extensor apparatus is remaining, and the hinge is a good choice for intrinsic stability of the knee. Uh, then you have a bone loss. You can use also metal augments. We don't use bone grafts in the septic revision, but we use uh, these particular metal cones or any other metal cones. Um, also, doesn't matter if it's titanium or um, structures, metal augments are very useful to restore the joint line and to restore the bone stock. Antibiotic loaded bone cement is very important to use. Uh, also, when you use uncemented implants, you can combine it with uh, an antibiotic loaded bone cement in this case to coat the implant and the release of the antibiotics from the cement can provide a high concentration of uh, antibiotics in the joint. You can cover the whole implant. This is a, a total femoral replacement and uh, it was covered with antibiotic loaded bone cement in order to provide a high concentration of antibiotics. We always discard the antibiotics both locally and systemically with the um, uh, microbiologist. This is Dr. Frommelt. I was working with many, for many, many years in the endoclinic. The standard uh, antibiotic load, loaded bone cement we are using is the um, Copal, uh, which has uh, two options, Copal G and C, where you have one gram of gentamicin and one gram of clindamycin 
uh, or the other option is the GNV, you have uh, 0.5 gentamicin and 2 grams of vancomycin. You can uh, even add antibiotics to this um, manufactured antibiotic loaded bone cements based on the susceptibility, based on your recommendation from the microbiologist. When I have uh, this kind of cement, gentamicin, clindamycin, PMMA, then I add uh, 2 grams of vancomycin, or when I have this one, I can add two grams of uh, meropenem based on the susceptibility. The duration of antibiotic treatment is depending on the kind of revision. When you go for one stage revision and you have a lot of antibiotic loaded bone cement in the bone, then you, you are allowed to go for a short term antibiotic treatment. When you go for one stage and you have no antibiotic loaded cement in the joint, then you have to go for six weeks of antibiotics. In the two stage, you have a long time antibiotics explantation with antibiotics, six weeks, and then reimplantation with bone cement, two weeks, without bone cement, six weeks. So it depends, the duration of antibiotic treatment de depends on the kind of revision you performed. In there, we recommend to go for antibiotic treatment for three months. This is also a very nice case with a total knee replacement with the rupture of the extensor mechanism, a lot of hardware, or bad soft tissues, uh, and it was operated at one stage, uh, reconstruction of the joint line, reconstruction of the bone defects. You can see nice central patella alignment and antibiotic bone cement. The patient uh, had only a very small amount of extension leg but was able to, to walk without crutches uh, even after this quite big disaster in the knee. Sometimes you have uh, very, very bad cases like this. This is all the, 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 um, on the limit of uh, one stage revision. This guy was from the United, United States with a big defect, no extensor mechanism, uh, infection of course, long uncemented modular implants, but he wanted to have one stage. It is not reasonable to go for one stage in this case. Of course, I would go for two stage in this case, but this guy wanted to ask us for a one stage revision and we did it. So this is the implant. It's very, very hard to remove. As you can see, a lot of cement, long stems, bone loss, bad soft tissue. So this is really crazy to go for one stage, but he wanted to do that. So we removed all the implant, we removed the infection, we debrided, and then we replaced the knee with a, more, with a mega implant, coated with antibiotic loaded with bone cement, very long stems, with plastic surgery, of course, and with the uh, orthesis because the extensor mechanism didn't work, but the patient wanted to do like this, and this is also the, the last possibility to help this patient. When you have no extensor mechanism, you can go for uh, allografting, but not in the septic uh, setup. Maybe later, uh, six months after septic revision, you can replace the patella uh, with a graft, like in this case we did. But to be honest, these are very, very uh, big surgeries with a high complication rate something about uh, 15 to 20 percent. But in some cases, you can do this and you can help the patient to regain the mobility. So one stage is a good option for patient and surgeon. You have less mortality, morbidity, uh, but you need a uh, very radical debridement. The advantage is that you need a shorter period of time for antibiotic treatment. You have lower costs. In 90%, you need no second look surgery. It's only one surgery. It is as effective as two stage. Uh, you have no impairment with the spacer, and that's why we like it. Of course, there are some drawbacks, uh, but if you are trained and if you can do uh, a good uh, debridement, you will be successful. Sometimes you need a, you have a bone loss with the infection, which is quite challenging, like in these cases with the Paprosky 3A defect. And then you have to uh, treat the infection and treat the bone loss in the meantime. 
like in this case, 72 millimeters of defect. You need big jumbo cups, but trabecular metal is a good option because you can use this shell without cement. You can use screws to fill the defect. And then uh, you can go for uh, cementation inside the shell, use antibiotic loaded bone cement, and then you can combine with a cemented implant and you can also treat the bone loss. Of course, you have to know your limits. Not everything is possible with the septic uh, revision when you have cases like this, uh, several operations before, uh, spacer didn't work, very bad soft tissues. Uh, you have to remove the spacer, you have to remove a lot of soft tissues, you have to remove a lot of bone. The bone quality is very bad, the blood supply is very bad. You have to resect the extensional mechanism. In these cases, you have to go for atrodesis or amputation, above knee amputation. Uh, nobody is happy. In the young patient, above knee amputation is maybe better. In the older patient, atrodesis is maybe better because the life with a stiff knee, with an atrodesis knee, is not so nice. Uh, but we use these kind of devices which are uh, cemented and uh, there is a good stability for the atrodesis. So to sum up, the diagnosis is challenging, but you have several options to have a perfect uh, diagnostic setup. Uh, you need several modalities. One method is not enough, so you have to go for aspiration, blood test, lab test, microbiology, and so on. Uh, when you have a multidisciplinary approach, you will be more successful and you will be more happy with your uh, treatment options and with your patients. For acute infections, you want to use the DARE, but the limit, time limit is 30 days. Uh, the gold standard is still two-stage revision. You can do it always. But in selected pa cases, selected patients, you can do the single stage revision, as I mentioned, and uh, patients will love it. You will love it when you are successful. For complex cases, it is better to have tertiary, tertiary referral centers. It, not, it is not everyone's surgery. So when you have the possibility to, to put the patients in a big center um, and have more cases to deal with, maybe it's a better treatment option for your country. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much for the invitation. And I'm ready for the discussion, ready for your questions. Hope to see you soon. Okay, uh, thank you very much, Akos, uh, for this uh, excellent talk. And uh, I've got a very experienced panelists, uh, and my co-convener is uh, Dr. Surendra Patil. Uh, before uh, you know the others can you know get their questions ready i would just like to ask you about the solution you use for the irrigation you said you use uh, pulse lavage and sometimes a commercially available uh, polyhexamide solution right yes it is the um, lavazorb it is called in germany lavazorb it is 0.04% polyhexanid you can also use a better betadine polyvidonion or you can use um, a chlora chlorine solution, chlorine, like pool water. Okay. And also you can also use a vinegar solution. So are these uh, solutions, uh, like, you know, like we in India, we make a mixture of, say, uh, betadine and chlorhexidine uh, and, you know, those things. So... What is your opinion about that? Or should we go for the commercially available uh, options? Yes. Um, um, chlorhexanate and um, you, know, you need, so you have, whatever you are using, you have to know about the characteristics. Can it be, can it remain in the wound or you have to wash it out? How is the acting time? For polyhexanate, I know acting time is, something between 10 and 12 minutes. So um, when you use um, octanicept, for instance, you need two to three minutes, but you have to wash it out from the, from the joint. Uh, you have to avoid contact with, um, with the bone and the blood. So uh, you can also use saline. It's also a good option, but a lot of water. So when you use water, 
use six liters of water. Better diet is good, iodine is good, but some patients may react with the um, allergy, so one has to be careful. Also, because polyhexanate could be uh, allergic. Some of the patients are allergic to polyhexanate, then you have to be careful. And have you used uh, Stimulan in your cases? Uh, you know. No, uh, in Germany, Stimulan is not uh, given free for the German market. I would be using uh, Stimulan very much. My, uh, my colleagues, my friends in the UK, they use it on a regular basis. Even in the United States, they use it. It's a very good uh, tool to fight the infection with local antibiotic treatment. Uh, we are not using in Germany because we, we have no... In the German market, is not available. Thank you very much. And I'm sure uh, there are many other questions from our panelists. Uh, Nikhil, uh, Vikas, Narinder, Surendra. Wonderful talk. I, I really have no questions. I have, I've heard this talk uh, when Ekosh came to us, to Writington. And my philosophy is uh, very, very similar to what uh, Akos said. So I really have no questions to you. Uh, yeah. Na Narendra, Vikas. Uh, my question is actually that the single stage revision has very, very limited indications as far as Indian scenario is concerned. So uh, where do we really draw the line? And all over the world, it's actually only endoclinic which has phenomenal results. Most of other centers have not been able to reproduce those results. So uh, we have had informed trial uh, going on in UK. I'm not sure whether the results have been published. And there was another Canadian trial which was going on comparing single versus two stage uh, revisions. So the results of those are not available. But uh, as far as uh, phenomenal, like really great results are concerned, that's only from endoclinic. No other center has been able to reproduce that. Uh, any reason for that, Akos? Uh, I'm sorry, there was an interruption of the connection in the last uh, sentence, but I, I, I understand the, the problem. So uh, there are many, many centers in the world who perform one stage, not only endoclinic. There, are, there is a center in, in Paris. There, is, uh, there are many centers in the UK, in London, in Wrightington. There are many centers uh, in, not only in Hamburg, but also in Germany, in many centers. Um, so we have right now quite a good evidence and quite strong literature providing information about the success rates of one stage. And uh, you can also compare the results, knees and hips, one stage, two stage. Uh, please read the paper of George, 2016. Um, yeah, I, I, I've read that and actually there's not a single randomized trial included in that systematic review. There's one in yeah. the also. So the studies included in the systematic review are poor quality studies, uh, not really phenomenal quality studies. So there is, we need to uh, accept the results of such a review with a pinch of salt, I would say. Yes, the quality of the, some of the studies is, is really... Uh, not not so perfect. I, I agree with you. And now, uh, first uh, um, randomized controlled trials are starting, and uh, the results will be published soon from the UK, from Bristol University, and from other centers. So we will see how is the performance of one stage and two stage in these randomized controlled can trials. I, but can I make a comment? Yes, yeah, please. Or yeah, there is one more problem with the literature that in the, like you said, not only is there no randomized trial, but if you look at the number of cases and the number of studies, the two stage revisions have got more studies and more cases. So the difference can be like thousands of patients versus hundreds of patients. The one stage has got less number of patients and less number of studies. But within these limitations, whenever you can perform a systematic review, there is no difference presently in the rate of infection eradication. Now, traditionally, we only looked at one outcome, which is how many people get reinfected. We never looked at the second outcome, which is what do patients want and what is their functional outcome? And there is no doubt for the few cases that uh, we have been involved with, with a single stage, that patients do like it. So we have been part of the informed trial by um, recruiting patients as well. You know, hopefully it will, uh, it will show us. Presently, what we know is that one stage 
there is evidence for non inferiority so we know that one stage is not inferior to a two stage what we cannot say is whether one stage is superior to a two two stage we don't have evidence of superiority but we have evidence of non inferiority yeah uh, yeah i'll just like to add uh, when we talk about infection and treating infection actually there are no winners here and we know that uh, we uh, one stage or two stage both the procedures gradually it, we are seeing that they have kind of equivalent outcomes the problem as uh, nikhil pointed out is the numbers still uh, the setups are not available people are not used to the one stage so the numbers although gradually growing are still like a trial showed 6000 compared to 6000 series of two stage to 400 series of one stage so these kind of differences remain but we need to understand then when we are treating a infected arthroplasty it is not always about complete eradication and being satisfied by doing a massive surgery for every patient and every time looking at your outcomes rather than the patient's needs so when we combine the patient need the circumstances of the patient the availability of antibiotics for that bug the treatment option of both one stage and two stage need to be carefully understood and utilized for that particular patient so we there is no fight between one stage and two stage both have almost it's like cemented stem and uncemented stem so we have horses for courses and the patient may actually benefit if the surgeon is familiar with the two techniques and if the institute can offer both with equal proficiency so i think uh, we need to learn the art the skill and formulate a team the microbiology because that would also improve the uh, results of two stage so there is no fight one stage also is as akas pointed out is technically a, a two stage surgery done over a longer period of time like if you go to the endoclinic that surgery would last 3 to 4 hours so same total operative time in one day or the same operative time 6 weeks apart so it's the similar procedure uh, spaced out so we need to decide what benefits that particular patient so this is something which i think we all gradually are coming to terms with and the uh, surgeons in the us the uk even in india like when we started few cases we have done we still have not formulated the team in arm forces we keep moving the team moves so we did few and had good results but there are very few to actually register our uh, results so what is the uh, writington uh, uh, experience right now nikhil Uh, very similar to uh, the endo clinic but the cases are lot lot less we have traditionally been a two stage center uh, professor ablevsky and uh, peter k have always uh, been proponents of the one stage and in fact he would say he could do a one stage even with a sinus and uh, ablevsky has published his results with a one stage so now we have um, an infection team we have uh, a very good mdt every friday morning all patients get discussed all patients get given uh, both options um and then we make a choice based on the criteria that um, akash just said uh, if you know the organism if the organism is sensitive if uh, extensive bone loss is not present so that i need to perform bony reconstruction and if the soft tissues are satisfactory then we would err towards a one stage otherwise we would go towards a two stage there are one or two cases where we have tried doing impaction bone grafting in a in a in a one stage with uh, vancomycin in the bone graft there is some data on that from exeter but uh, we are not really that comfortable with it yet and also uh, from also from heinz winkler good results with the vancomycin loaded bone fact, grafts yeah. yeah and the other thing what uh, ecos said is using a hip replacement as a prosthesis which is called the kiwi procedure or the qmars procedure so that uh, we do quite often and um, many times a patient does not come back for the so called second stage there's so a key the key we yeah. got yeah but yeah. now from from a badly cemented or a poorly cemented uh, i think most people are actually moving to a well cemented uh, one stage if you have to do it then you might as well cement it properly so that even the the, the problem of loosening can be eliminated yeah i very, uh, yeah. very much agree with vikas uh, because I am the opinion you have to uh, be aware of the possibilities what possibility what kind of surgery I can offer to the patient 
And when I can offer one stage and two stage, you can uh, ask the patient which kind of surgery you want. And you can also consider which kind of surgery I can carry out. Do I have all the criteria for one stage or do I have for two stage? And it is not a fight between two stage and one stage. It was a fight 30 years ago, but now it's not a fight again anymore because uh, it is state of the art to do the best possible surgery for the patient. And when you are, can deal with one stage, when you, have, when you are aware of the operative technique with the debridement and the uh, aggressive surgical technique, your two-stage revision will be better as well because you, can, you are more radical, more um, meticulous in your debridement when you go for two-stage and the results of your two-stage will be better. So this is a step in the training to uh, be able to carry out the meticulous debridement. And that's why I think when you can do both, one stage, two stage, then you can offer the best operation, the best treatment option to your patients. And you can discuss with the patient, with your colleagues, with your MDD team, which is the best option to this patient. Because none of this, uh, you have a lot of patients where you have a, uh, infection, uh, the soft tissues are not so bad, the bone loss is not so big, and why do these patients need a spacer? They don't need a spacer, they need a debridement and they need a new implant. So in these cases, you can go for straightforward one-stage revision and the uh, functional results will be much, much better than with a two-stage. Just yeah. one one question, Akas. I just wanted to know, what about your opinion regarding extended antibiotic cover? There was, like you, are, you said two weeks and uh, six weeks for if you, it was a cement loaded antibiotic, which you have already put inside, then it's two weeks. And if it is uncemented, six weeks. Is it hard and fast or do you go by uh, follow up CRPs or clinical profile? And do you ever extend the antibiotic coverage depending on these markers in the follow up? Yes, yes, we follow up the CRP and on a regular basis for, for six months, even in some cases, even two years after surgery. And uh, we stop antibiotic treatment uh, as earliest at six weeks, but if they have no um, drop down with the CRP, it's not a baseline CRP level, you can extend the antibiotic treatment. Or if they have an external source of infection, Sometimes if they have a, a bad skin situation or they have a psoriatic skin or any other bowel disease, then you can also go for a depot injections, penicillin injections uh, on a regular basis for six months um, to protect the patients from, um, from um, repeated infection and contamination. Yeah, one, uh, one more uh, question about the uh, diet. The DAIR, which uh, you have now started doing your center, and world over, the success rate varies a lot from 50% to 80%. We have also started doing it. And uh, uh, two questions. One, what is your kind of success rate with DAIR? And do you, like we have started also using VAC and doing kind of a stage DAIR when we go in, remove everything which can be removed, do a do nice debridement, get out the poly, put a VAC in, and uh, VAC Alta, where you can irrigate with the antibiotic. Uh, after the surgery, you ir irrigate with antibiotic for 72 hours and take them back after three to five days and put the insert back. So, uh, and we had a reasonably uh, good. So, we don't know how this, we have one study going on on that. But uh, what is your experience of DIR and how likely you are to offer it to your patient or you stick to that 30 days and... I am very critical with there. I only do it in, in very special cases. Uh, the best results you can uh, achieve when you have a hematogenous acute infection and uh, the symptoms are not older than two weeks, then you go for a there. In an early, early infection, early postoperative infection, it is also a good option, but your time is very limited. Uh, I don't want to use any irrigation system. I, do, I want to close the wound in the theater with the drain and I want to remove the drain two days after. 
I irrigate during the surgery, but not after the surgery. And I go for a very long antibiotic treatment. With, with this kind of treatment, we have a success rate something about 66 to 68 percent. So two thirds of the patients can be treated with there. Some centers have better results, and I think they use Stimulan or any other uh, local antibiotics. I don't know how the results in Wrightington. Very, very similar to yours. We are also very critical. Um, we tend to restrict to less than four weeks of symptoms. Rare occasions where we know the organism and it is sensitive and uh, it's in the patient's best interest not to have a very big revision. Then we will try a dare even up to six weeks with prolonged antibiotics. And then the problem with stimulant, what we have noticed is oozing of the wound. It does cause a lot of wound oozing problems. So I prefer to use stimulant only in the deep tissues or inside the bone or around the bone rather than in the subcutaneous tissues. I, I don't like to use it above the level of the fascia, the deep fascia. Yeah. Akash, can I ask you, what are your thoughts on fungal infections? One stage, two stage? In fungal infections? I have some cases uh, where I was successful with one stage, but for fungal infections, I recommend to do two stage. Two stages, yeah. yeah. I have some cases in the endoclinic, we perform also one stage. We have also published the results, one stage with fungal infections, but uh, it's not for everyone. So... Um, most patients, they are immunocompromised, they have bad soft tissues. Yeah. Um, so in these patients, it's better not to do a one stage. We, we also did an audit of Sinovashur, like you said, the alpha defense in. We did not find it very useful for confirming infection and, and changing the treatment plan. But where we found it useful is to exclude infection during theater. And if you are not decided whether you want to do a one stage or a two stage, then intraoperative cyanovasher. And the second uh, indication where we found it very useful is if you have a painful total knee replacement and multiple attempts to exclude infection have been unsuccessful. And you know, there are 20% of patients who are unhappy with their, with their knee and you don't really want to operate. And then a negative cyanovasher is really helpful to help you make the decision that you don't really want to operate because the chances of making them better are very less. So these two situations, we have found it very useful. Yeah. Unfortunately, in our country, Sinovashur came and now Zimmer introduced it and now, I don't know, for some reason, they have removed it. So we used it similar to what Nikhil said, that we were in our two stages just to confirm on the table we used to have it. And in fact, we used to save that strip with the documents to prove that it yeah. was negative. Yeah, so we used it like that, but they have... Uh, removed yeah, it. So, so I was of the prohibitive cost. Not many people could afford it except for the armed forces. Yeah. So leukocyte yeah. estrays is a nice thing. I think we can think of that because Akos just mentioned it's as sensitive and uh, cheaper and could be used. Yeah, especially to rule out the infection. If it's yeah. negative, you can be quite sure it's it's not an infection. If it's positive, could be yeah. rheumatoid disease, gout. Uh, uh, particle wear, loosening, infection, so many things. But if it's negative, it's not an infection, for sure. Mm. Quite sure. So I think uh, you have covered uh, most of the things which, uh, uh, you know, this topic, uh, you know, demands. And uh, Dr. Akos, you said you have to go uh, to uh, some in, meeting. In six minutes, I have another meeting, yes. So I think I will thank you. And we have Nikhil, uh, Narinder, Vikas, and Surendra with us. So we will continue for a few more minutes. And uh, on behalf of everybody, I'd like to thank you for your time. Thank you. Namaste. And uh, Namaste. Namaste. And uh, Namaste. you have a good meeting, and we'll be in touch. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Have a good meeting. Thanks. So, Nikhil, uh, bye bye. Bye bye, Akos. Yeah. So, Nikhil will have some cases now. Um, I have not prepared uh, cases for this one, but uh, I'll see if I can find my presentation. Do we have time? Yeah, I think we have yeah, some we time. Have, we have okay, some. give me two minutes. Any other points, uh, Surendra? I think everything is well covered. Yeah. Mm. I mean, Vikas, you set the stage yeah, very nicely so uh, for this. Uh, for this talk by Dr. Akos. And, you know, I know yours is a single center study. So yeah. obviously, you know, there are biases 
and uh, so, you know it uh, yeah. cannot really uh, you know encompass the entire complexity of our nation you know but yeah, only- it is really a good study because it makes one focus on the key issue and it's like a snapshot of mm. the problem and i think uh, you know across the nation definitely our reason for revision remains infection and that is quite an important thing yeah the idea was to sensitize the uh, population regarding uh, revisions and one thing uh, was that most of the patients were traveling from other parts of the country because in armed forces we had the single large centers which was uh, catering to a large part almost complete northern india and others traveling so 60% of the patients were from other institutes so it's kind of a homogeneous uh, population and uh, i thought it was a good indicator may not be exactly accurate but 60% is a very high rate of infection but there are some studies even coming out of the middle eastern countries and some a few from the west one from netherlands i think who still talk about infection being as the number one cause yeah, so there is some uh, fight between aseptic and septic still going on there is increase in septic revisions of late in the us so they are still again looking at that that septic may be gradually rising it's not that the septic is over Yeah, I was quite surprised. Akos also said the yes, same thing. Third. Yeah, third. So Akos said it's third or fourth, which I don't think it is. It is gradually. Uh, well, it is going down because the aseptic volumes are going up since they they have been doing plasty for a long time. Yes. In our country, aseptic have some time to go up as our numbers and the duration of uh, our Whether practicing. Whether aseptic is actually aseptic, we really don't know. That's yeah, that is a bit. Uh, clearly showed us that you yeah. know we start using antibiotic loaded cement your aseptic rates start going down now how, how is that explainable unless the aseptic is not the aseptic yeah so so the thing is that uh, when we were even writing this article and we submitted for joa also where they has some observation so one thing was they asked us the what criteria did you use so if you are using the like we use the msi as criteria for diagnosing so once you have used the criteria for diagnosis whether the culture is positive or negative that msis criteria has labeled it uh, septic whether you may or may not get a positivity rate depending on your culture technique depending on your right samples depending on your other reasons but clinically and other parameters all the msi criteria if you go by that and if that indicates infection it is collected um, as i've done them and this is a sample that illustrates most of the points that we dealt with in the theoretical uh, talk um i'll show at least one or two cases because like akash i have another meeting in another 15 minutes okay so this was a 65 year old lady who had um, a cemented totally replacement done using uh, a tapered poly stem um she had uh, quite a lot of pain after surgery never happy from day 1 she was diagnosed to have infection ultimately Uh, for whatever reason 
uh, two dare procedures were attempted um, even though this was a chronic infection and then she was on multiple antibiotics for 12 months uh, her blood parameters were abnormal and um, she had pain swelling and ultimately a sinus uh, burst out the organisms were resistant to most commonly used organisms uh, antibiotics. antibiotics so this is not one where i would consider well you know for the panel what would you do i would go for two stage yeah for sure yeah okay. would everyone do the same anyone would like to do a two uh, a single stage yes Medi- medically um, she has a um, she has well controlled hypertension not diabetic and no other issues two stage yeah definitely two stage so that was the lateral so in a two stage would you remove all the cement or would you be happy to remove only the cement that is loose and leave behind the very well fixed cement and any evidence in favor of or against so complete deployment involves complete removal of the cement every foreign body has to be removed including the cement mantle complete removal i would go for a complete removal even if it requires a eto would anyone go for partial cement removal in a infected case uh, one would err to remove uh, uh, everything rather than leave something behind uh, and akash also stressed in his talk that you know the key is a uh, radical you know debrima so uh, i don't know about the evidence but uh, i would like to so hear what you have some, to say some short term evidence from from right. exeter there, 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 there are left uh, cement yeah. behind uh, very very well fixed cement has been left behind uh, without any apparent adverse effect on the outcome but yeah. like you i prefer to remove all the cement what about in eto that was you can see that it's quite a long cement column it's almost um, i think a 16 and a half to 17 uh, cm cement column so this was what we were talking about in the previous webinars why i prefer to use a c stem uh, in comparison to the longer stems such as the exeter you know the the results of the exeter are very good but when you have to take out something like this you get a 16 17 cm cement column and uh, an eto then becomes almost inevitable whereas with uh, the shorter c stem uh, you can get out um, cement from the top uh, or endomedullary cement extraction without an eto so what would people do over here i mean certainly eto is very morbid and one could try and avoid it as much as possible and you know <coughs> instruments like oscar can help but not everyone has got it so you know one has to be prepared with an eto and do it properly especially if you got a long cement tail but uh, try and avoid it as much as possible because it's really a very morbid procedure and yet we saw at least uh, two or three cases that aquas said where yeah. he had a be- beautiful eto in yeah. fact one of the cases he has wired the eto and gone so for well. shorter, shorter cement extent the yes. stem does yeah. not even bypass yeah. the eto yes and uh, that is a philosophy very similar to one of my colleagues uh, dr perback he prefers to go for short stems as well um, unless there is need to what about a spacer would you would you if you do a two stage would you leave a spacer in or would you just leave it like a pseudo without anything inside definitely a spacer spacer so, so we I would prefer spacer we prefer a disjo- a, a non articulating kind of thing where we put a cement ball and a and uh, something for the canal but yeah that was my next question yeah. what would you do for the canal and what would you do for the so canal stimulant beads inside and a cement or if uh, we will just use a, a small rush pin kind of thing loaded with cement and on the cup side a cement ball uh, i have used the cane nail uh, in the with mm-hmm. the, you know antibiotic cement in the in the clover so, leaf part yeah and in some cases you have worked in the uk yeah in some cases where we felt as we discussed earlier that it could be a a patient who may not come back again and the infection looks very low grade simmering maybe tubercular at times we have loaded the antibiotic streptomycin on the cement and gone in for a dual mobility cemented like akash showed something like that which is snap fit into the head and used it as a spacer and patients some patients have not come back 
So, so that's you, like a Q mars only. That's yeah, like, yeah. A particle like a Q mars. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Something like that. So let's see what we did. So this is what I prefer as well. Non-articulated spacers, because with articulated spacers, I've seen a lot of problems, dislocations, fracture of the spacer, fracture of the femur, erosion of the acetabulum. So the most critical thing, I think, in management of infection is the debridement. And the maximum time and effort should be spent in getting a good debridement. I also think that if you are going to take on revisions for deep infection, the hardest learning curve is to learn how to debride uh, a hip or a knee joint and it takes a lot of time. So I was able to take out all the cement from the top without an ETO using a variety of different techniques and instruments. And then what I prefer to do is to pass a guide wire down the femur up to the level of the knee joint and then ream the femur and then take a back scratcher from the Morland set and make sure that you take out all the membrane and you spend a lot of time cleaning the femur out and then cleaning the acetabulum out and then a non-articulated spacer. So we used to have K-nails, but now they've stopped making them and we are not allowed to get K-nails from India, even though we have a supplier who is ready to give it to us because of some European regulations. So we just take a standard femoral nail, um, which fits and then put it down with uh, a blob of cement. And then the interval management is very similar to what um, Akos said. Just and one that question. That is the follow-up at four years. Just uh, a the second stage. Nikhil, uh, what do you have against articulating spaces? Um, personal experience, I've just seen that more articulated spaces have caused all of us in my unit more trouble than non-articulated spaces. So now if I strongly feel that I have to use an articulated spacer, I will use a hip replacement as an articulated spacer, go for a one stage That's and uh, call it a QMARS procedure or a KV procedure. Yeah, personally, actually, yeah. I, I use the Austin mode. And uh, I published that technique also in Techniques and Orthopedics. And it's, uh, I've, fortunately, I've never been troubled by it. That's why I was wondering, because uh, it makes your life so much easier. So in one of the webinars, I'll get all the problems, problematic yeah, spaces. Nickel, yeah, I think no, we, that would be good. Yeah, yeah Nikhil brought out. Published it, I think. Yeah, we also had similar problems in our revision series. And uh, gradually we moved away from articulated because bo of bone loss, dislocations, and it really doesn't help because you are going to go anyway in the hip. It is, uh, it doesn't serve much uh, purpose because it, uh, the space yeah. you always get. See, see, your soft tissues are much, much better if you got articulating spaces put in uh, correctly. So uh, that is where the catch is. You buy but most of the you, time, you need to spend your time even in putting the articulating spaces. A lightning fast surgery uh, probably doesn't help. You need to spend that time getting that spacer in, properly molding the cement mantle uh, in the acetabulum. And of course, the uh, uh, cement mantle in the femur has to be absolutely loose. So it works. The soft tissue balance is beautiful. Your, your second stage surgery becomes so better. much easier. It's your second stage becoming uh, much easier. You have to do lesser soft tissue releases. You have to do uh, lesser amount of uh, you know hunting around in the acetabulum. Uh, or uh, getting the soft tissue balance right, let's put it that way. What was the antibiotic uh, used in this case, Nikhil? I don't remember the specifics, but usually I use copal cement. We have G plus C and G plus V. So in the interval period, I would use copal G plus V or G plus C based on what my microbiologist tells us. And sometimes I've used G plus C and added two grams of vancomycin to it. Post-operative, we routinely begin with tycoplanin and ciprofloxacin. And because it's an infected revision, we keep them on IV antibiotics for at least seven days. So they usually get a line in theater. And then based on what the cultures, the early cultures come at 48 hours. The late cultures come at uh, seven days. And sometimes the very late cultures will come at two weeks. Based on that, we will decide whether to change the IV antibiotics to oral. Or if they need an extended period of intravenous antibiotics, then we have something called a home antibiotic treatment where the district nurse visits the patients at home to give the intravenous antibiotics. The problem with home antibiotics is you really need something which you can uh, use uh, uh, like a single dose. So Kiran, I'll finish this case, but I'll have to leave. I, I've got lots of infected cases. I'll, I'll show you next time the remaining, if, that, if you don't mind. Yeah, okay. So in this case, um, this was the second stage and that is the four year follow up. And uh, if I had shown you this X-ray as the first X-ray, I think majority of you would have agreed that this looks like a very slightly badly done primary hip replacement rather than a revision for an infection. Is that a fair comment? 
Yes. The, proximal, the proximal femur is quite badly deformed. So, it would have been a really bad uh, femur for a primary. So, if, if now, you... Now, this is the primary and this is the revision. You, you are oh. following what endoclinic says. Actually, in endoclinic, they say when you have an infection, you have to keep going shorter because infection gets, takes years to cure and the more you use up the distal canal, the worse the patient fares. So, it's Not just shorter... But the philosophy at Wrightington is to make your revision look like a primary. Not your primary look like a revision. Go short, restore the bone, give it back. And you know, the, the primary is on the left, the revision is on the right. And uh, My only question is, with that kind of uh, residual bone, where you have already curated out the previous cement, hardly any cancellous bone left, have, and you have not done an impaction bone grafting here. So In this case, I haven't. So, do you think this mantle will behave as the primary mantle? Biomechanically, it shouldn't, but she is reaching. Well, that x-ray was taken at four years, which was last year. She did not come for the follow-up this year in the COVID crisis, so she will reach five years. And uh, there was enough of a good bone for me to feel comfortable cementing. Okay. So, I'm very really sorry, but I'll have to leave now. Okay. But uh, I've got a fair bit of infected cases, which we can show some other time. Yeah, we will uh, discuss, Nikhil. Thanks for your time in this case. Uh, I will uh, see, I've got uh, one case to show, which, yeah. uh, can you see my screen? No, not yet. Mm. You need to share. Uh, Nikhil has to stop uh, Nikhil has sharing. Nikhil is not sharing. Nikhil is not sharing. I've already left the meeting. You can no. share, I think. Yeah. Can you yeah. see? Yeah. Yes, yes. So, this one. yeah, exactly. So, I was there with you in this. So, the thing is that uh, Nikhil talked about non articulating spaces, and uh, you know, infection can present in uh, various sort of ways. So, this particular case uh, had uh, multiple surgeries, um, and uh, this was the x-ray which she presented with and uh, she had more than seven surgeries where the surgeon tried to fix it again and again and this was the sinus and so many scars it was like a battleground of scars so uh, i used the k nail and uh, tried to you know make it into some sort of a you know ball in the acetabulum uh, using stimulon also in the deeper layers. I agree that if you put stimulon above the fascia, then uh, expect a lot of uh, wound complications. But in this particular case, it was uh, inserted in the femur also and in the deep uh, pockets. And this patient went back to Africa and she actually mobilized on it and it became a non-articulating spacer. Uh, so... This is what she came back after more than a year and everything had, you know, settled down. Uh, ESR, CRP was normal and all the scars had healed well. So, you know, what uh, would, uh, you know, you do now in this particular situation? I think Vikas knows this case. So maybe Narendra, would, what would you uh, recommend in this particular situation? Or if this patient comes to you now, how would you tackle it? See, uh, so soft tissues are settled well. Uh, inflammatory markers are settled. Normal. Yeah. So, uh, I would firstly like to see the acetabulum a little better. Unfortunately, I don't have better x-rays, but just okay. take it for granted that she's got, you know, reasonable uh, bone stock. No, okay. If the acetabulum has got bone stock, probably a cement, cemented stem with a dual mobility cup. I'd like to uh, go in for that. A long cemented stem, of course. What about uh, Surendra? Any particular uh, thoughts? No, same thing. If the infection is settled or the markers are normalized, then we need to go for the cemented uh, cup as well as the cemented stem. The femoral canal appears to be quite wide, so a lot of cement is going to be required to fill it. But uh, I think a long stem, cemented uh, femoral stem along with the cemented uh, acetabular component should be the answer for it. Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, I'm glad that all, all of you are uh, talking about cement because if you look at this canal, it's such a capacious canal. Right. And uh, to get a good grip of uh, a, a stem uh, is very, very difficult. Mm -hmm. 
and vikas said that you know try to you know the more you engage the femur in in difficult scenarios uh, you know the more uh, you sort of maybe invite problems so in this particular case uh, you know when i went in it was really looking very good uh, no infection at all um, and the soft tissues were really adhered to each other so i just went mm-hmm. straight down onto the bone and developed good flaps and did a thorough removal of all the uh, you know broken implants and this is what i managed to uh, uh, put in uh, so a long stem revision uh, etc uh, with antibiotic cement and uh, a cemented uh, rim fit uh, etc cup and this patient has done uh, you know fairly well uh she's lost to follow up she's gone back to africa but the last i heard is is more than you know 4 or 5 years now since the surgery so it's like uh, uh, yeah very well done mm-hmm. i remember yeah. this case yeah, just have you just yeah yeah uh, well, i just want to ask uh when you did this uh, you didn't have the choice of dual mobility available with you uh, no, no you didn't. Didn't. if it yeah. was if it was available probably you would have preferred that yeah it was not available at that time that's why i went for a large head and uh, the rim fit cup yeah so just for the audience and uh, the panelists uh, there is now link guys have introduced their mp reconstruction stem which is also it's a it also offers a modular cemented option so uh, you know you can go short hair and a cemented stem and build the body on it which usually was available for a uncemented version i have used but i have been in the team which used it in germany and they use it quite frequently in endoclinic and i was surprised that they have a modular cemented version and that really helps in such cases with capacious canal you can cement in here and then the body loads the rim also here and so what is the rim of the stem stronger, much stronger so the, all options so okay. it like a modular stem you get the options dia everything so it is a independent cementing of the stem and then you build the body like you do in a uncemented revision it's okay. available in india now so we just okay. got the uh, we have asked them to quote in our tender so they are likely to get so th- that that helps because two things it allows you the flexibility of recreating the offsets it uh, in such canals it is a, a boon you can load antibiotic and because the body can also uh, load the rim of the bone along with being much sturdier than this construct although this this will work etc is a good metallurgy and good stem but being cobalt chrome the, that uh, tension of it uh, not having uh, any support here and cantilever and failure that uh, instance is much less in that kind of a modular yes i mean that is definitely a good one to have so it again uh, brings us to the point that you know even in this de- generation cementation Uh, you know should not be forgotten and the art of cementing is important in primary as well as in revision scenarios and you cannot rely uh, that you know you know you cannot ignore uh, cementing so everyone has to learn it if you want to be hip surgeons and uh, you know this can be useful in all situations here for this particular case i want to ask you whether you were able to find out any kind of a bug out there and what was your antibiotic yeah. protocol for this being a multiple surgeries and all so because this patient came from africa uh, you know i think i remember the bug was a staphylococcus bug and uh, and, and but then the patient uh, when she went home with that canal spacer she was lost for follow up for a year okay. uh, so the antibiotics were only when she got it in in the hospital Yeah, so uh, for a week, seven days of IV one, antibiotics. One thing about bugs and antibiotics. Now that Surendra brought out that point, we all need to rethink our policy. We have been following the West, and second generation, generation cephalosporin has mm-hmm. been the the uh, mainstay. thing to be used. Mm-hmm. So mainstay, and uh, we all feel that that is it which is required. But when we studied the culture pattern of the revisions. even when we interacted with microbiologists when we saw the polymicrobial infections and gram negative now it is two three institutes that i am talking about it came out that maybe our gram negative cover also in the prophylactic uh, antibiotic needs to improve and has to be as per local antibiotic uh, culture reports so the your lab has to tell which is the best uh, anti uh, uh, gram negative antibiotic 
which is working best in that quarter or that like every hospital has its uh, antibiotic microbiology rep reporting every three months or six months. So we have been following that and we add to the gram positive or gram negative cover. And right now what is going on is miropenaminar uh, uh, because the amikacin sensitivity had gone down earlier. It was amikacin. So gram negative needs to be monitored carefully. Uh, it, close interaction with microbiology department and add it to the broad spectrum because gram negative infections are unlike the West common in our. Maybe That's a good point. And in the second uh, instance, when I did this uh, long stem, I just use a standard protocol. I didn't go for any extended antibiotics. Just uh, okay. two weeks. Standard uh, protocol. That's it. Okay. So, like a aseptic. Like a aseptic anyway. because it was absolutely normal. Uh, that is yeah. something which we have changed uh, in recent times. Uh, we have realized that even uh, when we don't have, we have cured it in a two stage. We are sticking to at least three months of antibiotic and then CRP fo following the CRP and going down to at times six months till the CRP normalizes that we have started. So that I didn't have the luxury yeah. in this particular patient, but it's yeah. a point to be taken. And, uh, Kiran, if we have the time or do we have another infected revision session? <laughs> I think uh, we <laughs> just got a few minutes maybe yeah. uh, and we can discuss about the next session uh, yeah, yeah. later. So, any other points? I have an interesting case. That, that's what I was uh, trying to say. You got right now a case? Ready? Yeah. So, why don't you share? Yeah, I'll just stop sharing. Yeah, you share. Yeah. So, I think we just got enough time for your case and then mm. we can wrap this meeting up. Yeah. Okay. Can you see my screen? Yes, we can. Yes, yes, yes. Okay, so, skip the theory and just go to the... No, there is no theory in this. This is a okay. long history. <laughs> I think you are aware of this case. Yes. Uh, I had a 68 year old female, had a THR in 88. I don't know what it was. She had an uneventful recovery till 2001 when she met with an accident and had a periprosthetic fracture, which was managed by internal fixation. What fixation? We'll just see. And till 2012, she was absolutely asymptomatic, very happy with the fixation. and. Uh, she said I was a little bit short, but that was all right. I was pain free, and but then she started, you know, had an accidental fall, couple of other fractures, managed conservatively, but unfortunately a very stiff knee, and she was arthritic also in the knee. In early 2014, started developing painful swelling in the proximal thigh, with aggravated by weight bearing, and then we eventually developed a discharging sinus there, and then presented to our OPD. And this was the picture that uh, radiologically, uh, she was wheelchair bound and painful restriction of movements, knee flexion, hardly any scarred skin, discharging sinus, old scar, of course. And I found the shorting to be about 7.5 centimeter. I, I, I'm sure nobody is going to attempt a, sing a single stage here. So this is what it looked like distally. Proximally, you can see. and. Distantly, the bone quality was really pathetic. She was a non-diabetic. ESR was and CRP, of course, were raised. But culture, as it happens in our country, usually sterile. The rest, most of the parameters were normal. That plate is called a menon plate. Menon yeah, plate, sure. yeah. I, I was getting there. The, what is uh, surprising here in this menon plate was that the plate is uh, titanium plate. Dipu, they withdrew it about 15 years ago. But uh, and the screws were steel screws by whoever was the surgeon who did it. He put steel screws with a titanium plate, but it, it worked for 10 years. So whether that was electrochemical battery going on there, I don't know. So when I went in, I found there was hardly any bone left there under that plate. If you see this, the X-ray, here you pray and hope that there may be some bone there, but unfortunately there was none. This is a customized spacer which I was talking about, which we do. Uh, this one, uh, of course, is a very, very long stem. I was lucky to have it there. And of course, after 10 weeks, I, I don't go in very early. I'm a little conservative as far as two stage revision is concerned. Six weeks of antibiotics, two weeks antibiotic free interval, and ESR CRP. And after that, another two weeks to work up the patient and get a final ESR CRP which was, uh, of course, uh, everything was normal there. This is what we removed. And 
this is what the if you see here uh, you can see that antibiotic uh, socket the cement socket which is antibiotic loaded and this one had a little bit of a stabler defect which helped that the uh, uh, singosi mode uh, ball didn't go into the pelvis the cement socket prevented it and we used a reef to revise this there was no no way i could have done anything else probably and this is what we did we did a, a gripsion cup on the top and a reef stem and we did have a follow up at 2 years only after that she is lost to follow up this is what she looked like yeah that's a good bail out and uh, very nicely done and uh, very well done uh, mm-hmm. you just about managed to escape the knee <laughs> <laughs> no the problem is not when uh, i contacted uh, contacted her for follow up she wanted a knee done <laughs> yeah you can find your enemy and refer it to yeah i i i know who who said it <laughs> bangalore willing to take it on <laughs> <laughs> okay i very think well uh, done, very well uh, good really case nice. and uh, it illustrated very all well the tackle. points uh, discussed with uh, in the is a real bail out stem for these yeah yeah is one of the uh, you know people uh, lately now we are convert going towards cemented a lot but this is one uncemented stem with this kind of bone stock left i think this should yeah, be yeah but because of its coating it integrates very well once i have tried to remove this at 3 months and if we couldn't remove the stem it was so well integrated yeah it is fully um, coated and it's a quite a good one <laughs> but then you you put a cement uh, layer in the acetabulum as well uh, and after that you reduce the moisture uh, 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 no, the spacer spacer the spacer yeah. stage you put yeah. a cement mantle in the acetabulum i always do that i put it at a doy stage and then okay. i reduce the like uh, okay. into it and then i mold the whole cement mat uh, cement mantle on the rim of the acetabulum Okay. So it doesn't go yes. in the whole. The whole cement can go into the pelvis if you have a medial okay. wall defect. This is what I had published basically, specifically how to manage the by putting the spacer with a medial uh, medial wall defect. Oh, it's interesting. Yeah, it's a good illustration. Uh, thank you very much, everybody. Uh, thanks, uh, gentlemen, uh, thank for this uh, conclave. We can uh, wrap it up, and uh, it these cases and the discussion covered all the important aspects of. Uh, you know septic revision and uh, dr vikas in his uh, published study has shown that you know we cannot you know be relaxed we have to be vigilant in our primaries infection is the number one cause in our country and we need to know all the tricks uh, of how to tackle it so uh, with this uh, i say thank you uh, very much uh, thanks uh, dr vikas to get uh, dr akos nikhil narinder Surendra, we missed uh, Gurinder Bedi. Uh, he was busy uh, in some other uh, function, and even Dr. Uh, Shukla was missing. So, thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you. Thanks, thank Dr. Neeraj and uh, Dr. Ashok Sham. Neeraj is there? No, I think he is. Who stopped this time? So, should we just leave the meeting? Somebody has to stop the streaming. Yeah, Dr. Neeraj will hold him. Neeraj is all good for that one. Yeah. He's gone out. Okay. So. So. Kiran, maybe you need to call Neeraj. Yes, yes, I will. I think uh, Surinder just called him. I'm bringing him. No. It's 21 hours. at what stage yeah. you put the yeah. bolus in uh, narendra that cement bolus in the acetabulum what time about uh, since i use the high viscosity cement 
it's about a 2 to 2 and a half minutes i it's a, it's a very so how is the consistency uh, the way you would like to cement the acetabulum actually okay at that consistency you put it at in that consistency and then you reduce the austin mur inside i use my, uh, the austin mur is actually not into the femur at that stage it oh so you you use it by the hand yeah and oh, okay I, i mold it then i loosely cement the austin mur because there's a lot of huge amount of cement which is there which yes. i will probably lose into the uh, somewhere into the pelvis or something i i don't want it to go too much deep okay so thank you uh, for that point and uh, dr neeraj i think thank you very much for giving us this platform uh, our meeting is uh, you know concluded thank you very much thank you thank you thank you vikas thank you narendra good night good night bye good night everybody thank you kiran thank you